So there we go. The, the video is going. The recording's going. And with that here, Jen, would you open us up in a word of prayer? Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's pray. Our Father, we come before you this evening giving you thanks for all that you have done for us, the way you care for us, for giving us this day. Lord, we just thank you for all your wonderful blessings. We thank you for this evening, this Bible study. We pray that you will bring all you here safely. We pray, Father, that you will give us enlightenment and give pastor wisdom and help us to learn this evening what you would have us to learn. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. And just so everyone remembers, this is Jan's last Wednesday with us. Well, You're going to be here next week? No. Oh, okay, don't scratch that. Jan's here next week. Pauline, you can make more stuff next week. Yeah. <laughs> I don't say I won't. <laughs> That's good, yeah. Yeah, the whole Jones. reason Pauline made all that good stuff was for you. No. A cupcake. No, okay. We thought this was your last Wednesday. Thank you. Sunday was my last Sunday. All right. You know what? I might as well finish out. So, so online we got Chris and Linda and we got Gail. And I guess Audrey is too busy having a good time up in Maine to <laughs> from <Bob. laughs> in, in person. In person there, we got Jan, as you know, we got Pauline, we got the baked goods, we got <laughs> Joe, and we got Beth, and we got Joe. All right. See, if you're here in person, then you partake of all the Pauline's yeah. great baked goods. Mm -hmm. All right. It's Snickerdoodle cookies, my favorite. Mm -hmm. So we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 18. We're doing chapters 18 and 19 tonight. Because then next Wednesday, we will finish up. So... Well, that'll be, that's a good question. The question will be, what do you want to do? And so I ask all of you to think about what you would like to study, a particular book or anything, and to let me know about it. Joe, that's about your fifth cookie. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, six. Oh, I'm being corrected. That's the oh, sixth no. cookie for but no so if you guys have a preference for a particular book in the bible uh, or a subject about the bible let me know okay you can just email it to me or text me but please let me know and then you know that's what we can be looking at but this sunday we're looking at the trial and crucifixion and then next Sunday, or next Wednesday, <laughs> next Wednesday, we'll be looking at the resurrection appearances. Which are those cookies the last would do two that. chapters. Hmm? I said, I didn't know those cookies would do that. Yeah. Get you all mixed up. <laughs> yeah, get you all mixed up. Yeah. Yeah, what is in those cookies? <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you, you really want to know. <laughs> Okay, moving right along here. So now, these two chapters that we have, this is what they call the passion narrative. Okay, the, the, the arrest, trial, beating, crucifixion, and burial, that's all part of what's called the passion. And 
there's differences in you know, the passion is definitely in all four gospels needs to be in all four gospels because the gospel wouldn't be a gospel without that story in there because the good news is that Christ died for our sins. And in John, though, as with other parts, this story is a little bit different. John as a gospel, really the Romans play a much more central role than they do in the other gospels. And the belief is, is that what John is trying to show was this crucifixion of Jesus is not just the Jews. That it's Gentiles and Jews coming together. And that just as Christ came for the whole world, so that all who believe in him you know, would have everlasting life, this whole world includes the Romans representing the Gentiles, anyone that's not Jewish, and then the Jews. And this is way of John bringing them all into play. So he emphasizes much more strongly the role that the Romans will play in this than the other Gospels do. And the other thing is there's absolutely no mention of the Garden of Gethsemane. No praying in there. Judas does not kiss Jesus. He's there in it, but he doesn't kiss him. And it's the only gospel where in the arrest, there's a conversation that Jesus is having back and forth with the officials that are arresting him. So these things you won't find in any of the other gospels. So it makes John very unique. Okay? So now, let's kind of get into, unless there's any questions or comments or thoughts, let's, we can get into it and dive into it. Why would that be? Why is, is it true that the Romans were more prominent? Did anybody know why John? Yeah, because John is showing it's the whole world. It wasn't just the Jews who crucified Christ. It was the Gentiles too. They're all, this rejection of Christ comes from all corners. And Jesus is saying, the world rejoice, you know, will be glad. And you'll and remember what we just read in his closing statement. He, Jesus said, hey, for you disciples, the world's going to be rejoicing. You're going to be sad. But then in a few, you'll be happy again. <laughs> this world being sad covers everyone, not just the Jews. And so in here, he, he shows the role more prominently of the Gentile side and its involvement in the crucifixion. Okay. So remember, John is always thematic. He's always what? Thematic. In other words, showing a whole theme, oh, an theme. idea. Thematic. And so, yeah, thematic. T H E M A T I C. And remember, one of the themes. That John had that we talked about way back in the beginning in that ancient history when we first started this thing was about the world right. the whole world not just a portion the whole world okay. okay and so he carries that all the way through even here into the rest and crucifixion so let's get into it uh, would someone read uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 11? When he finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. 
So Jesus came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some of the officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said, and Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the word he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck, stuck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Good. I feel good. Nothing sounds good. <laughs> Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with the commanders and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who it was the father-in-law of Cleopas, the high priest that year. Cleopas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. All right, thank you. Okay. Yeah, you read a little bit beyond 11, but that's all right. Don't worry. <laughs> yep, and G is bong, a new kind of Roman. Well, I'm sorry, bong, B-O-N-G. Is that kind of a new kind of Roman arrest procedure? Where are you at? Down in G. Way down. He hasn't gotten it. not supposed to be down that far uh, yet, Joe. Oh, well, no, no, don't worry about it. What are you doing? Go, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I know. You're going way ahead. Yeah. Okay, it's a typo, no, Joe. It's, it's, it's a typo. It's a typo. Yes, it's a title. What's it supposed to be? Bound. Um, is bound. Bound? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be a D, not a G. I just wanted to clarify that. Yes, yeah, so I'm not talking about marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> or any of that joke. All right. Anyway. So here we are. Okay. So after his prayer, that whole chapter 17 was a prayer. It talks about descending into the Kindred Valley. So right there, you have a little map. I drew you a little map here. So the walled city of Jerusalem, the temple areas in the back there, they leave out the east gate. The east gate was the same gate he came in on Palm Sunday, all triumphant. And they go down this, it's a weedy little road, and it's about a 200-foot descent to the bottom of the Kendra Valley. And then it's a 200 foot ascent up to, up to the Mount of Olives. So they're weaving all the way down there and that's where this is taking place. Okay, and they get up to the Garden of Gethsemane and that's where he gets arrested. The, well, the Mount of Olives. What body of water is that? Pardon me? What stream or river is that going through the Valley. It, it's the Kindren, it's like a Kindren, it's a Wadi actually. And and the, the Kindren Wadi, and the Wadi only fills up when it rains, or when there's a good storm up, up there. Yeah, that's why it was primarily used as a big garbage dump. It was the, it was the big Jerusalem landfill. And today, to, so today, because the wall's not there, there's only that one main part of the old wall of Jerusalem, what's called the Wailing Wall right now. You have the back end of the big dome of the rock, and you have some buildings, residential buildings there. The slope isn't as steep as it was before anymore. You have the wadi, and then on the other side where the Garden of Gethsemane was and the Mount of Olives, there's more buildings and residences there. And then they got a little place off that supposedly 
loved the Garden of Gethsemane and the exact spot where Jesus prayed. And of course, many centuries ago, they built a little church building there as a, as a place of prayer and stuff. And then there's a bazillion people selling trinkets and souvenirs all over the place. So. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's there now. The Wadi's still there. But there's a lot of archaeology sites in there because it was a garbage dump. And so in there, they can dig up things. They find tons and tons of, of things from the period of Jesus and even before. Um, so moving along here, um, notice Jesus knows he's going to go be, be betrayed. So he is purposely going to the place where he is going to be betrayed. He knows it's going to happen. This is another part of him being in control. And then Judas comes to betray him. Now, they, John's the only one that mentions this big group that comes to arrest Jesus. Earlier in John, remember the high priests decide, the priests decide they want to try to arrest Jesus at an earlier time, and they send some of the temple police to go do it. Remember what happened? Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, they said, we've never heard someone speak like this. He's amazing, and the people love him, and it sounded like they didn't want to find him guilty. Well, but, it, yeah, yeah, he was they a couldn't very do popular it. figure. <laughs> yes, he was making sense. Right, so now we see in this thing of going to arrest him, you got a detachment of Roman soldiers. So John's the only one that mentions this detachment of Roman soldiers along with the temple police. That would be a, a detachment would be about 200. All fully armed and everything like that. So what would be killed for one man? Yeah, all for one guy. <laughs> along with the, all the temple police. Well, do you think maybe they thought he was going to do some kind of miracle that would knock them all down? Or... That would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild, John. Didn't at one point, didn't he walk, disappear from them? Right. Yeah, one time he just walked away. That was in, in, a, in one of the villages. He just walks away. They, they take him up to a high point to throw him off the cliff. And he just he walks did, through yes. it. And yeah, <laughs> they knew him. So here, 200 soldiers, the temple police come, and Pharisees, the Pharisees, it is speculated, believed, that they were most likely representatives from the Sanhedrin. And then it, it talks about the lanterns and torches and weapons. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the lanterns and stuff, if they decide to skedaddle and all run away to Mabuji to be able to search, they're going to have to look through the dark area to search for him and everything. Shouldn't be any darkness there. It should be lit up like daylight with all that. With all that there, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so all of this comes. And we're told, if you noticed in this, Jesus knew what was going to happen. There's this continual emphasis all the way through this that Jesus is totally in control. No matter what, he's going to be crucified and he's in control of it. Not any of these other players. And so they ask him that question right off. Jesus, in this, you know, in the other Gospels, Judas comes up and kisses him on the cheek. And then, boom, they arrest him. Here in this one, this crowd comes up, and Jesus turns and asks them the question, who are you looking for? And notice in this one, Judas is just standing off to the side. He's part of the group, but he's just off on the side. 
Judas really doesn't play too predominant of a role here. And so then he asks that question, who are you looking for? They reply, Jesus of Nazareth, which can also be interpreted, and sometimes in some translations you'll see it, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus responds here, I am he. But in the Greek, if you were to do a literal translation of the Greek that's used here, it's I am. Which, yeah, some make a big deal that really that's I am. He's saying, yep, yeah, I'm God. Which then, notice the reaction that happens with the guards. They fall down. I never, re once I've read John, I never remember reading that part of it, or getting that part of it. Yeah, they, they, all, they all fall. That's a lot of people to fall. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I have a hard time imagining 300 people and these Romans and all their stuff, you know, all tumbling over, but they fall back. Now, depending on which commentator you read or, or look at on this, you know, some will say, well, Jesus speaking this word, I am God. You know, the old, every knee will bow and every tongue come back. They just can't, you know, this is God himself speaking and that power comes out. And so that, yeah, is what causes them to fall down. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that impact them in some way? Like, hello? <laughs> you would think. <clears throat> you would think. Yeah. But remember, Jesus is in control of everything happening here. Yeah. Jesus is in control. He's going to get arrested. And, and that's one of the hardest parts to, to comprehend. Jesus is not the passive victim here. He is the one fully in control. Just by speaking the words, I am, he wipes out the whole group. They all fall down. Imagine what he could have done if he really wanted to. The, the ones whose eyes should, or ears or whatever should have really opened up were the, the uh, Sadducees or the Pharisees, I mean, were there. Because they know the word, supposedly. And when he says, I am, and they were, even they were knocked down. Well, that and should have been but the thought. The thought is better for one person to die yeah. than everyone. You know, they got in their mind this practical but thing. That made them trouble if Jesus rouses up the Romans, they'll come and they'll squash us all. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure we just get rid of Jesus and then we don't have to worry about. Yeah, you would think that would make them shake their boots a little bit, right? Yeah. Even though they know that yeah. they're going to get him. And... But again, that Jesus says, so you can just imagine almost a little Laurel and Hardy routine, they're all getting up from the ground. And then Jesus asked them again. But this time in the Greek, it's very, it's very commanding. Who is it that you're looking for? You know, and then when they say, Jesus responds and he says, I already told you. And he says, let the others go. I mean, his disciple, right? Yep. <clears throat> All you want is me, let the others go. And he's saying, let the others go, as this says, in order to fulfill the prophecy that he, had, he hasn't lost anybody. And in the graduation address, he had already mentioned that before. Father, I haven't lost, in the prayer that we read last week, I haven't lost anybody except for Judas, but we already knew that one <laughs> kind of thing. And here it's repeated again. He's commanding them to let them go. And, and the thing is, is... The way Jesus is saying this, and in the Greek, it's it's a command. It's directed. 
It's not a request. I'm pretty pleased when you let them go. Just take me. He's giving a very forceful command to them. So yeah. even though, even though we, yeah, the one guy has your call, they weren't going to take him anyway because Jesus commanded them to leave him go. He, and it's going to happen just the way. And again, yet another indication of how in charge Jesus is of everything going on here. Peter then pulls his little Yehu at, you know, of whipping out his sword and cutting off the ear of Malthus. And Jesus then rebukes Simon. And he says that thing about drinking the cup that the Father's given me. What do you not see here in John? Not putting the ear back on. Yeah, not I really. know. It was like, here's the ear, and it's laying there. Put it back on. That's right. Because it's in Luke. So don't now, you know? why don't you think? Here you go. So why did John not talk about the healing of the ear? That's not important. That's not the important part of the story. Okay. A thing of importance. One thought. Any other thoughts? So John, remember, focused on the seven I am's. And so his big, except for the graduation address teaching, the big part of the teaching was all around the seven I am statements. And then we focus on seven miracles, seven signs though. John doesn't call them miracles, he calls them signs. So this isn't considered a, a sign or a miracle. Right? So, and John doesn't bother mentioning any others to include this one. But you think this is, I mean, this is a miracle. I mean, but he doesn't, I know he doesn't, but it's a sign. So John's focus and what, what's the difference between just the sign and the miracle? Do you remember that? Testing the old knowledge. Anyone remember the difference between just be, it being a sign and why it was these specific signs versus calling things miracles and doing all the other ones? Remember, John was always focused on seeing and believing so that you will see and believe. And so each of the signs were signs that confirmed who Christ was as the Messiah. They're the type of signs that are attached to prophecy. And so John goes... John later, in, at the end of John here, he'll say, oh, if you try to do all, you know, write about all the different miracles and everything Jesus did, it would fill volumes. He focused specifically on May 7 because then it encompasses all the others and all the other kind of categories if you were to try and categorize them. And then he really makes a, a very purposeful point once he's done talking about because he has grouped the theme all together in this part of his writing it, he now moves on and we won't mention any other that are grouped. And why seven? Was there a reason besides the seven? Back well, then? The se remember the seven, there's a big thing on numbers <laughs> and seven is perfection. And so there you have the spiritual perfection. Now the signs have all come that it's perfect now. And this is the perfect description then of Christ in the I am statements. And so, yep, we don't see John mentioning the ear being healed. Or about the ear just going around like Van Gogh there. <laughs> so seven signs and seven miracles in the book of John. The signs seven signs and seven, seven I am miracles. statements. And so, several what? I am oh, statements. Well. The seven I am statements. Oh, I am. Yeah, it's not seven miracles, it's seven signs. Okay. 
Yeah, and we talked about, if you look at the, the, the previous sheets, we, we went through those. And they're grouped together. You're, you're, they're grouped, the big thing is they're grouped together. So you got the seven signs first, and then there's a little bit of an overlap with the I am and the last sign, and it goes into the rest of the I am statements. And then they end, and then we're in going into Jerusalem. Which, okay, so I get that the signs are attached to the prophecies. There, you, you'll see, a, yeah, there's distinct prophecies concerning the Messiah in terms of, you know, care, you know, taking the poor, feeding the poor. The blind can see. The lame will walk. And, and so they become that it shows, okay, he has control over healing the body and biological things, but he has also control over literally making food out of nothing. And he also has control over literally, you know, the wind and the waves and weather and everything. And so it shows this complete control. So if you see these, you have to believe, you have no doubt. It's confirmation that he is truly the Christ, the Son of God. You see what I'm saying? I think so. And that, and John just focuses in on them. On, on the signs? Or on the seven signs seven. and the seven I am I statements. Am. And that's why we don't see any other type of miracle stuff. Like putting the ear back on. Yeah, like the ear being put back on. Because he's already talked about the miracle. We're not talking about those anymore. <laughs> so the signs are attached to prophecies concerning physical things, you're saying? No, concerning, concerning, concerning what? the Messiah. Concerning the Messiah. Right, what the Messiah would do. How you confirm that? Oh. You see them in Isaiah and Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. You see them in Daniel. Right. And if you go back to the old sheets that we have, the sheets from before, you'd see that on the thing. I referenced that in those sheets when you're dealing with each of those. And the I am is just showing that he is. He is. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the vine. Right. So he is. Yeah. I am I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Okay. Okay? Yes. All right. Thank you. So now Jesus is bound, not bound, he is bound. <laughs> <laughs> and he's arrested. That happens there. Yep, that G, the G on the G there with B or whatever, it's not that it's bound. <laughs> All right, so now we get into the trial part. Okay, so would someone read? Now, it's interesting in this trial because he cre John creates a very nice drama where it goes from one scene, Jesus to Peter, Jesus to Peter. And it kind of has this nice going back and forth thing. That's why you see these verses divided up. So let's just kind of take them in groups here. Would someone please read just verses 12 through 14? Then the, then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Anas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for his people. Okay. So, Annas is the son-in-law of Caiaphas, and he's kind of like the... the Josephus betrays him as like the prosecutor. So that's why Jesus is brought to him first. So he's 
brought to him and they make the connection. The other connection that's going to come into play here later is Annas was the high priest. He had given up the role. He had switched the role off just about two years before this and then Caiaphas became the high priest. <clears throat> And that's going to become important too because they keep on saying the word and, and basically when a person had that you still always refer to the person other times as being that role that they had that's kind of like we still call president. Trump you know President Trump it, even though he's not formally the president it, they still referred to Annas as being a high priest but Caiaphas was the high So, okay, now let's jump down to the next scene. See, all of a sudden, now, so there we got Jesus. He's before Annas, and now we're going to jump into Peter. So let's, would someone read 15 through 18? Simon, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus because this disciple was known to the high priest. He went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and the official stood around by a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Okay. So, see, in this account, Peter and this other disciple, who's the other disciple? John. John, John yeah. They come there. Notice John actually goes into the high priest's office to consult, but none of them were arrested. And then he comes out to get Peter and bring him in. And the, as they're coming into this courtyard area, it's an enclosed area. So you got the big temple, and then off the temple, you got the area that was the play, the meeting room for the Sanhedrin. And it had an area that where you would meet, where the high priest could meet people separate from the Sanhedrin meeting room be kind of like this conference room and the social hall being where the Sanhedrin would meet for their big meetings because it's 70 people. And then off of that, though, was a courtyard. And the courtyards where all the servants would hang out and the temple guards would hang out and that were on duty for that night because there were always groups on duty all night long. And so... The disciple comes out, brings Peter in, and as they're coming in, in John's account, that's when the servant girl that's leading them in says, hey, aren't you one of the disciples too? And Peter says, no, I'm not. And who's right there with them, though? The young disciple, John. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And I don't think that's in the other Gospels. No, it's not. And I always get a sense that there's um, like a rivalry between Peter and John. So John would build this up that Peter. I mean, it's in the other disciple or other accounts that Peter did deny Jesus. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there just always seems to be a rivalry there. Yeah, so others take John there are some that take John and say, oh, he's so arrogant. He's so full of himself. He, he, he's always in the favorable light. He's even in the favorable light at the cross. And no one else is. And oh, isn't this, you know, John's just so full of himself. But notice John never mentions himself by name. 
It's always the other disciple or this disciple that Jesus loved. And so some people talk about that. It, it, is, it is an interesting thing. By the time the Gospel of John is written, John is the last disciple standing. <laughs> no one to. <laughs> yeah, they're all, all the other ones are gone. Wow. He's it. Can I ask a question? Of course. How can you put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all in chronological order when some, when he doesn't mention things that other disciples mention and well, just by the manuscript evidence, okay, the manuscript evidence, Mark is viewed as being the first gospel. Okay. Okay? And then it's always a dispute between Matthew and Luke, which one of them came after Mark, because majority of Mark, almost like 80% of Mark, is found in Matthew and is in Luke. And that's why they believe, okay, Matthew and Luke, to write their account, must have been using a lot of Mark okay. to put into it. And so that is, that's, the, that's kind of the idea of how it goes. And then what you see in, in Matthew and Luke is Matthew, there's even an argument now that it was written in Hebrew because they actually found a Hebrew manuscript. Matthew is very, very much geared to the Jews. Luke is very, very much geared to the Gentiles. Whereas Mark is just kind of a real basic almost outline of what happened. It's, it's very action oriented and you could almost turn it into a bullet point. John's in a whole class by itself. <coughs> the literary style and all that, it didn't even exist when they believed Matthew and Mark and Luke were written. And that's how they know it had to have been about 80 AD or even 90 AD before it was drafted. Its literary style is so different. It's very Greek. And that's one reason why some people say some scholars said, and we've talked about this in the intro, that John didn't write it. It was written hundreds of years later because there's no way. But then that theory got blown to bits when they found a manuscript from 90 AD. Well, fragments of a manuscript. And if you remember on the first thing, they had a picture of one of those fragments there. And since it's dated back to 90 AD, well, there goes the idea that... The, it was written around 200 AD. But the style is so drastically different. And that's one reason why they believe, yeah, this had to have been written much, much later. Because of just the style and the language used, the Greek used, the refinement of the Greek. You know, we use... How, how people <coughs> spoke in the 1950s is different than how they speak today. Right. And so if you're reading something, and it's like Pauline earlier had showed me a commentary. Her commentary is from, I think, the 1960s, 1970s, I believe. I believe the copyright on that particular one would be. And it's using words in there that aren't common at all today. Okay. And it's real, it's real high, and that's how 75, they do it. 1975. See, I told you, that. see, I'm pretty good there, right? I kind of know my commentaries. <laughs> I, I didn't read that, I read the stuff on the inside now. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Moving along here. So, we get now, let's go back, and now we'll see, we're going to jump back to Jesus now in his trial. So, would someone read 19 through 24? Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. 
Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then the Nass sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Okay, so notice this. He's before Annas, we have told, and this is what I was telling you about. Annas is used to be the high priest, and he would still be referring. So when the guard strikes Jesus and said, how dare you speak this way to the high priest, that's why he's saying that. Right. Even though we know Caiaphas is it, and then he says, oh, he gets bound and sent off to Caiaphas, the high priest. So we get this. Again, this whole idea now we go back to Jesus and he's grilling him and now he's going to send him off to Caiaphas. And when he's sending him off to Caiaphas, it's not just Caiaphas, it's the whole Sanhedrin. Okay? Now we don't see what happens in that trial. We don't see what happens in John in the trial with the, the whole Sanhedrin and Caiaphas that, like we do in some of the other Gospels. One of the things to kind of keep in mind, though, who do we know because we heard they were part of the Sanhedrin previously who do we know would have been there at the trial? Well, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And Paul. Paul, because why he Paul? He was Saul at the time. He was Saul, but why would he have been there? Well, because he was um, a descendant from the tribe of Benjamin. He, he, was, he was a disciple uh, of um, Gamaliel. Yeah. And get, he and he was the leader. He was one of the leading intellects of the Sanhedrin. And so they always had their, just like today, you got the congressman sitting there and their aides behind. The Sanhedrin were the kind of the same thing. They had their main aides behind them and stuff while they were sitting there in their council so their aides could go fetch things for them and stuff. And so Paul would have been there too during this hmm. and that's you know that's one thing to keep in mind all these individuals are there when Jesus has this trial yes a lot of people there yeah to to condemn him now we jump back to Peter's second and third tonight so would someone just read verses 25 through 27? Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, You aren't one of the disciples too, are you? He denied it and said, I'm not. I'm not. He denied and said, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, didn't I see you with him in the garden? Peter denied it again. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Okay, so notice here, when Peter's denying it, in John anyway, it's a very succinct statement. I am not. And in that third denial, immediately, in other words, right with it, kind of like, saying I am not in the dumb siren blowing over there in the firehouse. That's what happened with the, the crow, the rooster crowing there. So, cock crowing, whatever. That's, you know, happened simultaneously with it. So then, now in this drama, this part of what Jesus had just talked about, Peter denying, has taken place. And we now go, boom, straight to this. 
Notice it doesn't talk about Peter going out and weeping or anything like that. It just leaves it. And now we go back to Jesus again in this trial. And would someone live now this time? And maybe Job or Beth will read here. Or whoever wants to, I guess. But um, read verses 28 all the way to... Um, Oh, that's tough, isn't it? Anyway, 28 through 32. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness by the Jews, uncleanliness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against the man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to him, said, take them, take him yourself, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words of Jesus had spoken indicated the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Then Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it, to you, what is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If you were my... If you were, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. For this I came into the world to testify the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no bias for the charge against him, basis for your charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release one prisoner at time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas has taken part in the rebellion. Okay, so now... Thank you. You read a lot more than I oh, <laughs> oh, you don't have to apologize to say this for the later. But anyway, so in this here, notice what happens first. So they bring they bring Jesus over to Pilate. So they're coming from the temple area where Pilate is is just next to the temple area, the big courtyard area of the temple. So it's not that long of a walk dragging over there. But they don't want to go in. To where Pilate's at because to do so would make them unclean and this is now the Passover day the time when they are supposed to be preparing for the Passover and if they're unclean they won't be able to participate in the Passover meal so they don't want to go in so here's here's Jesus but we don't want to step foot in your thing so now they're gonna make Pilate the governor come to them, which is kind of like, it's not going to put them in too good of a mood right off the bat. And, and then notice their snide remarks back to him. Pilate asks, well, what's, what's this man accused of? What's going on? And, and they just get, hey, we would have done it if it wasn't something bad. We should have smacked that for talking to you, huh? Well, and, 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 and basically Pilate is saying, well, fine, you take him back then. And then, and then they bring up their kind of their trump card of saying, hey, he's guilty of trying to do rebellion against the emperor. Okay, let me choose here. Yep, okay, I guess I'll go with the emperor. <laughs> and be worried about that. So then he takes him in to question him. And he, he's brought into his chamber there to, to lead in the question and notice the question that goes on back and forth between Pilate and Jesus there. 
you know, his first question shows that he is very familiar with who Jesus is. Because he asks, so are you king of the Jews? Because the Messiah was supposed to be the king of the Jews. And he asked him, and Jesus, you know, in response, asked him, is he asking because he wants to know personally? Is he making a personal inquiry into Jesus? Or is he just doing it because others have told him these things? And Pilate takes offense at this. And when Pilate takes offense at it, he kind of becomes impatient. And that's why he's saying, look, I'm not Jew Jewish at all. And he points out that the, the, the Jewish leaders themselves brought him over here. So what is it that he did? And that's when Jesus says those famous words, my kingdom is not of this world. There is nothing in this world of sin, and you really always have to remember the symbolism in John all through, that the world, the word the world refers to sin, the world of sin. My kingdom is not of sin. This world's of sin. Ain't nothing from this world gonna come into my kingdom to include us. We only come in because we come in through Christ and then we're no longer of this world. And that's why the scripture says being in the world but not of the world. And so he really is emphasizing, hey, my kingdom's not of this world and nothing's coming from it. And you know, he states that he personally came to the world to testify to the truth and that everyone that belongs to the truth believes in him. Notice how he's using the word truth here. How is Jesus, you know, since we got 2020 on this, how is Jesus using the word truth here? He's using truth here as a thing for salvation. Him. Jesus is the truth. Remember one of the I am statements. I am the truth. So I have come to testify about the truth. What's the truth? Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth, to me, Jesus, Ah, they listen to me. <laughs> really, see how much you see how that really, really makes sense. Really knowing the truth is knowing Jesus. having a relationship with God, right? Because anything outside of that ain't true. It's not true. Well, and when Pilate, the way he says it, like you know, what is truth? That you know, whoever on an earthly throne makes up their own truth. So truth is so in the Greek, the truth that Jesus is talking about is this great spiritual truth. Pilate misunderstands, and then he's just talking about objective truth. Well, what's objective truth? What's right. truth? It's who's ever in charge. Right. And that's why he just kind of throws that out. It's a rhetorical question. He's not expecting Jesus to answer. Pilate is a politician. And then he's just Throwing that out there. So then Pilate decides, okay, I'll provide an option. He's not seeing anything too bad. This is just some sort of wacko thing, you know. Now, Pilate's not a nice guy, but he's pissed off at the Jewish leaders, so he's not too interested in letting Jesus off. I mean, he's, he's more interested, maybe I can let Jesus off, and that would really piss them off. Well, I'll get back at them. And so Pilate offers his choice, this option with Barabbas. And all four Gospels tell about Barabbas. And there we got another typo. Who is not Juju? <laughs> 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 
I didn't get that far because yeah. I yelled that from reading and, it. And so when John, John identifies him as a thief and a bandit, Mark talks about him taking part in the rebellion. Matthew talks about him being a notorious prisoner. You know, like a really famous kind of prisoner. Luke calls him an insurrectionist and murderer. And he and here, what does you know? So so think about the rationale here. The Jewish leaders are saying, okay, we want Jesus to die so that the Romans don't get up, upset with us because Jesus might lead a rebellion, and then the Romans will get mad and they'll lead a rebellion. So he puts up Barabbas, who has already led a rebellion that was crushed and is scheduled to be executed. And the crowd now is chanting for that guy <coughs> to be released. And that, that's the irony that's kind of dripping in this whole Barabbas thing. So now, given the time here, Jesus, what happens is they call for Barabbas. Notice he doesn't condemn Jesus right away. When you get into chapter 19 here, and you can read it on your own, what happens is Pilate takes Jesus, has him flogged. Now there's different levels of flogging. And, and one's a real weak level, and then the level they used for crucifixion was a very severe level. The most severe level, the one they used for crucifixion, it would be multiple people whipping at the same time. They had level leather strips. Those strips had bone and metal in them, and that would tear into the skin. And the art was to do it just enough to really, really induce a lot of pain. And so when they were crucified, there would be excruciating pain also because of all these open wounds. It was sometimes used as a way of execution to just beat someone to death. But for a crucifixion, it was just done in a way so it produced the max amount of pain. And so, it's believed that that's the one that was used. There's a lot of arguments among scholars as to which level was used first and then next. We don't know. It just says he was flogged and there's nothing in the Greek to really indicate which level. The Roman, notice here, John emphasizes that the Roman soldiers mocking him. So it's not just the Jewish people, it's also the Roman soldiers. And then Pilate brings them out and puts them on display. And believing it's going to invite some sort of sympathy, it doesn't. The crowd want him crucified. And they use the word, he violated our law because he claimed to be the son of God. Now that got Pilate's attention. And the reason it got Pilate's attention is because in Roman mythology, the gods, goddesses, would come down, mate with humans, and have children. And you never wanted to deal with one of the Roman gods' children because, by golly, then you'd piss off that god. <laughs> so it's very understandable that that got Pilate's attention. And so Pilate is a little worried about his own pagan superstition coming in. But then what happens is Jesus' response to him emphasizes about him not being in charge and that Jesus is in charge of this whole thing. And then he's faced with this idea, okay, do I provoke this God I do not know? Or do I deal, worry about provoking the real life emperor who I do know? In, in Pilate's case, is his father-in-law, because Pilate was married to the, the emperor's daughter. <laughs> and anyway, Pilate decides, okay, he'll be crucified, but I'm going to do it this way. 
take them off, but I'll wash my hands of it. So it's not my judgment, the judgment's yours. And thinking, okay, that way I won't piss off that God because I'm not the one that crucified him. <laughs> and so then Jesus is taken out. Now when they talked about carrying the cross, all it is is the cross beam. Often in movies, this is done well. The, the, the main vertical beam, they were all in place in the skull, the place of the skull. And what happens is you carry the cross beam, and then when you got there, they actually had ropes that, that would lift up the cross beam. And that would help induce the agony. And okay, so he wasn't, he was just like tied to that cross beam. He wasn't already nailed. Right. But when no, you get here, that's what they would do. Yeah, what they would do is they tie into the cross beam and you'd walk through your death with the cross beam. And the skull, the play, the Golgotha, this place of the skull, it got its name because of all these executions the Romans did there. And the, what they would do is basically when the bodies would stay on the cross until they literally decayed and dropped off and there would be all these bones and things and it was a real smelly place. And it was near the roadway coming in so everyone would see it. And then every victim always had a sign on them and Pilate in this case, when you read, he put on the king of the Jews and it upset the Jewish leaders it was purposeful to upset the Jewish leaders, but he put the king of the Jews as the sign on there. Okay? And then here, though, we have this whole piece about uh, we have the dividing of the clothing, as we know, fulfilling in Psalm, and then we have the whole near the cross, and John's the one who talks about this, is we have Mary, his mother, it talks about a person, this is the only place we ever see the person mentioned, Jesus' aunt, Mary's sister. You don't know who she is. We also then have Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, and John. All there at the cross, watching this crucifixion. And here in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes John responsible for Mary. Okay, so John becomes responsible for him. And here Jesus then talks about being thirsty. They give him sour wine on a sponge and put it up to him and he drinks. The whole purpose of that being there was typically to prolong the agony so people didn't die too quickly. And then after he drinks, and that's what makes it so significant that the very next verse is Jesus saying it's finished and he dies. So something that's supposed to give him strength and prolong it and it shows again clearly, and John's trying to emphasize here, Jesus is in charge, all the way to him proclaiming his own death. It's finished, I'm done, boom. And then we have the whole piercing of the side. Pilate grants, okay, you can kill him before the Passover and everything, and he grants a quicker execution. And they, by breaking the legs of the victim, they suffocate, the arms go up and they suffocate. This is pulled up, and they'll all die within the hour. And then they come to Jesus. City's already dead. They run the spear through him just to confirm death. The burial of Jesus, the important thing here, notice the people involved. Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple, and he calls him a disciple, and Nicodemus, who is on the Sanhedrin. And that they use this hundred pounds of myrrh and alloys. And that shows the extravagance. And normal burial, one, they, most Jews would not bury. They didn't have family tombs. That was an extravagance of itself. And, they, and when it did happen, it was normally about 20 pounds. 
Here, it specifies 100 pounds. That shows the extravagance. What we're talking about there is close to like 10, 20 years worth of wages. So Joseph was very rich. Yes, and so was Nicodemus. I don't think they worried about price. <laughs> yeah, and so then he's even given a place in Joseph of Arimathea's family too. And he's buried. Okay. Any questions or concerns? I know we're way over. And I apologize for that. Okay. Well, thank you for bearing with me on everything. All right. See you guys later. Okay. And good luck with your new doc, Chris. Oh, and I don't know if you heard Stephen's home. Was he home? Okay. okay. But Rose is still with Judy. Oh. Okay.